Um, we're delighted to have Dan here. As many of you know, he was scheduled to come last January, I believe, and he was doing international peacemaking, who knows where. Had to do mediation in the Republic of Georgia. <laughs> the Republic of Georgia, and he caught a Georgian bug and came home sick. I guess it was a Georgian bug, or maybe it was an airline bug. And came oh, home yeah, sick, and we had to, it was right at the, at the last minute we had to cancel it, and I was thinking, um, do we want to schedule another? Another speaker, can we slip one in? And I thought everybody who signed up wants to come to international mediation. So instead of that, let's just invite him next year. And so we're absolutely delighted that you're able to be here this year. And I said to Dan, got my message today about the change in location. And I said, I hope you're not bringing electronics. And he said, wow, I got this notice just in time. Um, I feel like in some ways we're, this is a good thing that we have to change here because the recount is going. And it's going with like hundreds of people in this room that's not very big. They're crowded too. Um, but it means everybody else that was scheduled for that room was bumped. We then quickly scheduled this whole big room and found out yesterday that the sheriff needs it. And you know, I love to say no to individual sheriffs, but I've never actually said no to Clayton yet. And so we said, of course we will share it. But why do they get so noisy all of a sudden? <laughs> okay, so um, delighted to have you all here, and and um, we're delighted that Dan is also here with us. Great. Well, it's a good to be here with you all, and thank you so much for coming and uh, for inviting me to be with you. Um, a few words of introduction about me. Uh, I'm a uh, minister. I've been a, I've been a uh, pastor of American Baptist churches in Boston and in Dearborn. I uh, was actually a colleague of uh, Don's in the clergy there in Dearborn for a while. And, um, uh, and it was at her birthday party that this idea of me coming to be with you emerged. And so thank you for the, the Craig connection, was, Craig the divine the opportunity <laughs> <laughs> that emerged in the birthday party. Um, uh, for the last uh, t 13 years now, I've been working full-time as uh, my job title is Global Consultant for Peace and Justice for the American Baptist Churches. Uh, I'm basically a missionary, but rather than being based in one country, I work around the world, and my area is peacemaking, to try to help people not kill each other. And um, uh, it, that gets me involved in a lot of interfaith activities as well. Uh, I'm one of the founders of the Interfaith Leadership Council in Detroit, and uh, so I've got a number of books uh, over there, um, and uh, three of them are collections of mini biographies. Uh, two are interfaith heroes, and then one is uh, Blessed of the Peacemakers. Uh, unfortunately, I forgot to bring my generic version, but this is a specific version that has a special chapter in from my denomination about peacemaking. But uh, on Amazon, you can get this without the uh, Baptist uh, side to it. Uh, <laughs> then I also have uh, Peace Warrior, which is my memoir. Yes, I'm old enough to have a memoir. Uh, it tells about some of the peacemaking, some of the stories I'll be sharing with. Uh, and then We Are the Socks, strange title that's got a fascinating story behind it. Uh, but this is kind of like uh, stories out of some of my experiences around the world. And um, um, and so those are available, as well as uh, I saw somebody picked up a flyer. There's a flyer. Uh, we're raising support for uh, some of the people that we've trained around the world that have taken off and doing things, and I'm going to share a little bit about that as well. Um, so I'm not a professional mediator, and I honor all of you who are and who've been doing this for a long time because it's really out of this field in a lot of that uh, so much has emerged I think that and also labor management discussions in terms of conflict resolution work and uh, but I was a, a pastor as I said and um, and my first mediation was as a pastor between uh, two groups in my church uh, we had the older group uh, that was on this church council uh, almost all white and the youth group almost all black and the youth group wanted to have a sleep-in in the church and they, 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 they were turned down by the council 
And so the, the youth were all upset, wanted to know why. So I ended up having this get together and it blew apart. It was like the bomb going off at ground zero. And, and, and I just did everything wrong and was kind of helpless and just watching this disaster happen. And I, that may have been one of the places where my desire to find a better way uh, developed. Um, and so, so it kind of came out of disaster that <laughs> I started some of this journey. Uh, eventually I became a, a, a peacemaker. Uh, I'd been an activist in, in inner city Boston, uh, dealing with a lot of racial violence and criminal violence, and, and um, uh, as well as on the peace movement, uh, uh, nuclear arms race, uh, U.S. policies in Central America, et cetera, et cetera. And I ended up going to our our denomination's headquarters directing their peace program, which was a, kind of a traditional peace program kind of thing. But then one day, this guy from Burma, uh, now called Myanmar, walked into my office. He was a church leader, and he wanted help mediating between the military government and the uh, ethnic insurgents. And... Uh, I kind of looked at him and I said, here's some books, would you like some <laughs> books? You know, kind of gave him some books and uh, didn't know what to do. Uh, but later we got uh, challenged by some Mennonites, and particularly one person you've probably heard of, John Paul Lederach, who uh, mediated uh, in the uh, Central American uh, conflict, especially between uh, the Nicaraguan government and uh, uh, some of the Contra insurgents, and played a key role in starting the peace that grew in Central America to end those wars. And John Paul, uh, we met with John Paul, this guy Saboy Jum and I, and, uh, uh, and the next thing I knew, I was swept into this process uh, for three years, I was the only non-Burmese citizen on the Burma Peace Committee who was doing this mediation. Uh, and uh, it was a very, very interesting process, and it kind of had mixed success. But uh, uh, one of the things that had happened is that when you look around the world, all these local conflicts during the Cold War got internationalized and globalized. So it was kind of the US versus the Soviet Union, wherever the front may be. And once the Cold War ended, all those local conflicts are still going on or erupting, but uh, now they were viewed as internal conflicts and countries didn't want people from outside, diplomats, to butt into their internal affairs. And so who was who was there to try to help the warring parties find a way uh, out of their, their cycles of violence. And uh, many times it was religious leaders uh, that were being turned to as people who had the trust of uh, the warring parties uh, to be somebody who could kind of hold the space for them to start negotiations. Uh, sometimes they weren't so much mediators as uh, conveners of uh, peace talks, but sometimes they did play more assertive roles in the processes. And um, so I started discovering those kind of things. It wasn't always religious folks, but many non-governmental folks. Uh, you may know the uh, famous handshake on the White House lawn that uh, uh, between Israel and, and the uh, PLO at that time, and uh, um, and it was it was not politicians who started that process. It was a Norwegian educational NGO that uh, hosted the talks, and the mediation took place in a private house in Norway with kids, uh, toddlers, playing on the floor while the Israeli government and the PLO representatives were, were meeting and discussing and ended up, you know, that's where uh, the most significant peace agreement to date in that uh, uh, conflict is, uh, was uh, forged. And so, so a lot of us, in religious contexts especially, we haven't been trained in this kind of thing. You know, I didn't know anything. I'd read a lot. I'd been doing community work, but um, you know, I started reading a lot more, especially of John Paul Lederach. I said John Paul consulted with us, um, but uh, uh, th that whole thing of uh, f seeing that uh, who is it that is trusted, and that people turning to that, and sometimes they don't have the skills. Now, one of the things John Paul talked about and is written about is the combination uh, of a team in mediation. Uh, especially the kind of mediation with uh, warring parties 
uh, I'm not sure exactly how you translate that here, but uh, um, he talked about the insider partial and the outsider impartial. The insider partial is somebody from the context of the conflict. In that Burma, that was Saboy Jom, this church leader who was a Kachin, one of the ethnic minority groups. And uh, uh, they know the parties, they know the history, they have to live with the solution. Uh, uh, then there's the outsider impartial. In that case, it was me who comes in from outside but has a little bit more objectivity, uh, sometimes more distance, which can give uh, uh, a little bit more opportunity for being perceived as neutral. Um, some of the Karens, for example, they trusted me more than Savoy uh, because of that outsider nature. Uh, sometimes you also, as an outsider, can bring the skills, uh, the, the knowledge of processes, uh, and so I did a lot of teaching and educating some of the indigenous uh, mediators. Uh, later we did training. Uh, Saboy set up a training thing for both Christian and Buddhist uh, uh, mediators, ethnic minorities, to, to mediate. Uh, and so bringing those skills in and sometimes also resources, because a lot of these uh, processes cost a lot of money uh, to, to, to fund. And uh, so, so we were... Um, that partnership between the person from inside the person from outside was uh, was very very uh, critical. So along the way, you know, we started developing, and I got involved. I spent especially uh, 17 years working on a peace process in northeast India uh, with the Naga people. Uh, you know Michigan geography, right? Okay, Indian geography is this. Uh, and the Nagas are right at the tip of the thumb there. Uh, some of them are actually in Myanmar, uh, but most are in India. And they'd been fighting India for uh, since 1955, a, a war that uh, at times was genocidal in the 50s and 60s. And then in 75 there was a peace process that was flawed and the various Naga factions uh, well, the Naga organization that was running their, their resistance split and then these factions split and it became worse than a soap opera and everybody's fighting everybody including also fighting against the government of India. So we began, I worked with a, a Naga church leader that invited me into the process named Wati Ayer. I've got a chapter about Wati in this Peacemakers book. It's an amazing man. And uh, Wati and I and uh, some others uh, began uh, a long peace process, um, and uh, it's still going on today. But we've got uh, we've got uh, a uh, not a political agreement, but we've got we've got uh, an end to the violence, and, uh, uh, and and things are still continuing on. But there's they they signed this covenant of reconciliation that everybody is held accountable to. Um, now and so so that was a very successful process um, uh, even though it's still ongoing and I'm going to say more about that uh, in a little bit so um, so I'm getting a little older so maybe I'll retire and join you here uh, Sally uh, working at the uh, mediation uh, locally at some point but uh, as as uh, as I've gotten so that I start seeing retirement, it really caused me to refocus what I was doing and stop looking at me doing the mediation, but say, how can I empower the next generation? How can I equip them and uh, walk with them? So one of the things I developed was a 10-day intensive training in conflict transformation. Now, that includes conflict resolution mediation, but we also deal with diversity in groups, what we call mainstreams and margins, because that's an issue everywhere on all every conflict. Um, uh, we deal with power dynamics, we deal with nonviolent struggle, we deal with uh, uh, community organizing and building strategies for movements for change. We deal with trauma and trauma healing uh, because so much of the conflicts are fueled by previous traumas and you know cycling around how do we break those cycles. Uh, and um, so uh, as, a, as a part of that uh, in the conflict resolution things, we, we teach uh, steps to win-win solutions uh, as, as, a, as a part of it in mediation. In fact, we did this role play, we do this role play of uh, dealing with armed groups because some of the people are doing that. And so I developed a role play out of the Naga work and, uh, 
and uh, so we have uh, that as a part of the training. So in September uh, 2013, my wife and I went to Kenya and we had uh, this 10-day training and we had uh, people from eight different African countries uh, participating there and one was this young guy named Boaz Kaibarak. Boaz is from northern Kenya and uh, I had met him earlier in the year and been up into his region of Kenya. It's a very rural area that's based on cattle, uh, the, ec the economics, and there's a lot of cattle rustling. And it's, it's like the Old West, except instead of six shooters, they all got AK-47s there. And, and, and uh, the Kenyan police won't even go into this area uh, of West Pokot. And uh, the Pokots and the Turkanas have been fighting each other on and off. And, and um, I went with, with uh, Boaz to this uh, village, this Pokot village. It's right on a little stream, and the Turkanas are on the other side. And, and a week before we'd gone there, uh, a woman had gone down to the river to get some water and been shot and killed and, uh, by the Turkanas on the other side. So tension's really high. And, and I was just really impressed. Boaz is is in his mid-20s. I mean, he was 23 years old when we first, uh, back here in uh, 2013. And, uh, and Boaz is a peace commissioner. So it's kind of like a formal position from the government, but it's not a government position. It's more like a community position that's kind of blessed by the government, but not blessed with any money. <laughs> So Boaz has this title, and he has a little desk, and that's it. He doesn't even have a car. He has to, he has to scrounge out his own funds to go drive out two hours from the provincial capital where he lives to, to Turkwell region where this conflict's going on. And so, so uh, anyway, Boaz, I was just so impressed with him uh, doing things that nobody else would do and going unarmed into this heavily armed area. Um, uh, a place where government vehicles have been shot up and so Boaz can't go in a government car because that's an advertisement, shoot me, you know. Um, so Boaz uh, was in our training and uh, that was in September uh, 2013. In October, uh, Turkwell blew up and uh, uh, something like 130 people were killed in a rural area. That's pretty dramatic. And uh, BBC picked up the story and uh, uh, and I was reading B the news off the internet off BBC and I saw that and I said, oh my goodness, I know exactly what, where this is and what's going on. And Facebook messaged him and I said, you know, what's happening, Boaz? And he said, I'm going right now. He, he sold his goats so that he could get enough money to, to go into this uh, conflict zone. This 20-some-year-old kid. And he goes in there and he, he says, I used steps to win-win solutions. It really worked. <laughs> and uh, he, got, he got, one tribe had laid siege to a village of the other tribe and was kind of starving them out. And um, he got them to separate. He set up uh, consultations with the elders, the tribal elders on both sides, so that if you know, some little thing happened, that they could uh, defuse things rather than get it uh, to blow up. And, uh, and uh, right now it's kind of blowing up again. And uh, he and I are talking a lot about process and, and all that. But uh, uh, for two years, there was no violence. And he started doing uh, peace building workshops. And, and uh, they did peace marches from one tribe's villages to the other. And, um, and they, they also did a lot of work with women. Because uh, uh, women, many times, are the uh, overlooked folks in the, you know, the men are the ones controlling all the politics and, um, and fighting and uh, many times the women are uh, traumatized and victims but they also can be profound change agents and um, so uh, Boaz started doing special training uh, in, co in conflict transformation and trauma healing for the women and you can only do so many have so many people in a workshop so he gathered in you know like 20 or 40 women uh, in this workshop and uh, found out that there were something like 400 women who gathered outside the workshop saying we need this uh, and he had, to, th th he had to improvise and do some sort of program or speak to them in some sort of way um, but uh, also trying to you know teach others to teach others so that, that kind of multiplication happens at a more profound level um, so uh, that's kind of how it's, uh, it's been working. 
We, we also see this happening locally. You know, you don't, it's wonderful to be a professional mediator. We need those kind of people, and I, we need you all. Uh, but in a lot of people, in their daily conflicts, you know, some people ask me, do, do I have to get somebody professional to help? And I say, well, you can, you can actually, with a, a, a little bit of understanding, you can facilitate a process in your own conflict where you're one of the parties. Or sometimes you're a mediator, uh, not in a formal sense. And uh, so I, uh, I've been doing a series of classes at my local church, Genesis in Royal Oak, and um, this guy John Tegel is an architect, and uh, he's a church architect, and uh, he, uh, he had a conflict with a church that was developing, I mean, buildings in churches don't go together very well. <laughs> they're, they're usually a source of a lot of conflict. If you get tired of doing this work, that may be something you could you know, do some side work in. And uh, so John's the architect, and they had hired a contractor from within the church. And it was, hey, yeah, yeah, you can see how this is going to go. And it went bad. And so these folks now are, they were talking about getting lawyers and all kinds of stuff. It was just blowing up. And John was in the class. He said, said wow, you just thought, tomorrow I'm having this meeting with them. You know, and so we talked extensively and, and uh, some things, some processes and language he could use and, and stuff. And it worked out really, really well. He said people were just ecstatic, you know, because it moved it out of this deadlock. It was looking for some sort of legal thing where they were talking together, getting on the same page, setting up each other's understanding expectations and needs and so on, and, and able to come up with something that they felt was moving them forward in a unified way. And so, you know, sometimes that kind of teaching, uh, uh, giving people skills. Uh, same thing happened uh, with, uh, with our family, you know, when our kids, we got three kids, and uh, as I say, that doesn't make me an expert in conflict, just experienced. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I've had my flame outs, you know, and, and terrible times, but we would have these family meetings where we would uh, try to work through some of this process with the kids on our family things. So one day I'm, uh, I'm doing, this is out in Pennsylvania, Don lived with us in Boston, Pennsylvania, now in Michigan. And uh, so we're in Pennsylvania and, and I'm, I'm doing something in the kitchen and our backyard's right out there and I can hear the kids play and our daughter Janelle and, and some of her girlfriends got in this fight. This, this, you know, I can hear the yelling going on and all this. And Janelle starts this process that was kind of a simplified version of, you know, getting to win-win solutions. And, and, and I just listen in and it's like, wow, that's my daughter. She's now a neuroscientist. And she works in these neuroscience labs with a lot of egos. And she's a peacemaker in the lab doing the same kind of thing. So, you know, giving people the skills. And uh, so that they can, whether it's in schools or in families or in community groups, uh, that people can put these things into play um, in their conflicts. Now, even the best of us will still get stuck. And so there'll come those times when we need that outside person to help and, uh, and, and, and mediate. And uh, so uh, kind of, uh, let, me, let me shift it a little to, to that, that there's tools and we teach tools, we teach processes, but there's another piece, another element, and you've probably experienced that in your own thing. It's the art. It's, it's, it's not a science, it's an art. And there are skills that are important. You know, and every artist needs to know uh, a little bit about the materials you're working with and the tools that you're working with and how to do them. My wife's an artist. But with those tools and those skills, you don't produce art. You know, you can produce, you know, kind of uh, technical stuff, but the art comes from a different place. And I think in peacemaking and in mediation, Sometimes we need that art. John Paul Lederach wrote a wonderful book called The Moral Imagination. If you haven't read it, I strongly, strongly uh, uh, recommend it. If you don't know who John Paul Lederach is, he's a professor at Notre Dame right now. But he started the Conflict Transformation Program at Eastern Mennonite uh, University, and now he's at Notre Dame. Uh, one of the I'm not sure if he's heading it, but he's one of the people at the Croc Center there that does a lot of mediation. He's written tons of stuff 
about mediation. But the moral imagination, uh, he, he kind of, in some ways, corrects his earlier writing, where he says, there's sometimes when the process isn't enough, you know, and, and there's that art side to it. And, um, and I could really relate. Let me tell a couple stories of the art of mediation. Uh, as I was mentioning, I was involved for many, many years in the Naga peace process. Uh, we started first with the Naga insurgent leaders, trying to bring them together and uh, so that they could enter into effective dialogue with the government of India. And, um, and we got somewhere, we got, so at least we were talking, but then we just got stalled out. And it didn't go anywhere. So we backed off of that and we began changing the context, developing a different uh, context, a, a peace constituency, if you will, in the Naga people and then later in the Indian public. And, um, uh, and so we did all kinds of things for that. And, uh, and then it really uh, took a quantum leap when Wati Ayer, this uh, church leader, um, who had been the, the driving force in the peacemaking, uh, uh, Wati ended up convening uh, talks in Chiang Mai, Thailand. It was the safe place everybody could get to. And we called these the Chiang Mai talks. We had, you know, a long, long series of, you know, t talks. And, and uh, I was involved uh, working with Wati and some other Naga peacemakers who developed then th this whole group. They eventually were called the Forum for Naga Reconciliation all Nagas, and then there was uh, the outside group was me and a team of British Quakers uh, and uh, we were kind of the, the uh, facilitators of the process and Wati and his folks were the conveners and kind of holding the space for us and um, uh, so uh, the second Chiang Mai talks were, we finally got everybody from all the factions there and uh, and they ended up making a statement, a public statement, that they were working on reconciliation. They released that, and the next day, just as everybody's getting on the buses to head to the airport or wherever they were going, news came from Nagaland that one of the major factions had ambushed uh, cadres from another major faction, six people had been killed, and just, oh, it all exploded. They're yelling at each other, yo, we're at peace talks, and you guys kill her, you know. Disaster, and we're done. We're done. Everybody's got tickets flying away, and we're coming back in two months. So, you know, all our careful work was shot to pieces, <coughs> and literally. And uh, so we come back in two months, and uh, Quakers and I, you know, we, we all come in a day early, and the Quakers and I are, uh, as as people are starting to arrive, we're having these very serious discussions, you know, how are we going to handle this, you know, tomorrow we're going to do this, you know, then we got four days plan it out very carefully, you know, our steps, and, and we know the tensions are just off the charts, and, uh, uh, and Wati comes in, and he says, we're playing football, now fo football, soccer for uh, Americans, we're playing football, and, and uh, uh, Quakers and I kind of look at each other, what, you know, where, where did this come from, and and we said, Wati, you know, things are so tense and, you know, this is a very, very difficult situation. We've got to make, maximize every moment to try to, and, you know, how are we going to handle this? And he, said, he kept saying, we're playing football. And, uh, and we kept trying to argue with him and talk sense into him. And uh, finally he said, well, it's too late. I've already told the factional leaders and they've all taken off to the mall to buy uh, sneakers. And... Um, so we go out to this raggedy field somewhere in Chiang Mai, and, um, and we played football. And it was brilliant. What Wati did is he put all the, the factional leaders who were literally trying to kill each other, put them on the same team. And he put all, we, we also had the tribal leaders, because th there's something like 17 different sub-tribes among the Nagas, and, and uh, uh, some of them fall under the same division lines as the political factions. And so we had a whole bunch of the key tribal groups that uh, there, and so he put all the tribal leaders on the same team and distributed the peacemakers on both teams. And uh, in about 10 minutes, we all knew something profound had happened. 
these guys who are trying to kill each other, you know, one of them trips over in the field and this guy who'd been trying to kill him is helping him out. They're laughing together. They're, they're, they're working together. And it, it, by halftime, we started saying, we have got to do this back in Nagaland. And, and by the end of the game, uh, we, we are driving back in these uh, kind of uh, truck cabs, uh, planning how we're going to take this uh, uh, peacemaking football matches into Nagaland. Uh, what had happened is that he had taken all this talk and all the politics and, and everything and he'd made it tangible that we can be on the same team with the same goal. Uh, and and it, it got them at a deep visceral level uh, and, and it just transformed everything. Now we had a lot of other things that we did uh, during those, those four days, you know, a lot of the hard work and negotiations and politics and we also had some religious things. Uh, all the Nagas are Christian, basically, and so we had some religious components to uh, try to draw them together. But uh, uh, that match was so important. We, they ended up having two matches in Nagaland, uh, one in the capital of the state. Nagaland's a state in India, uh, the state capital, uh, Kohima, and then one in the largest city, Dimapur. And in both of the matches, they had uh, teams uh, drawn from all the factions, and then the other team, was, that was one team, and then the other team was from the civil society organizations. And uh, they had days of prayer before the match. They had, and in Dimapur, they had women and children whose husbands and fathers had been killed in the factional violence give uh, flowers and words of forgiveness to all the players. Uh, really profound times uh, together. Uh, the art of uh, peacemaking, who would have thought, you know, football would, would, would actually end up saving people's lives in Northeast India. You know, it, was, it was the breakthrough that we needed. And Wati was sensitive to that, and us professionals, you know, we were, you know, here it is, what's next? And, uh, so that can be really important. I had another time when I was, uh, I was mediating uh, in a church mediation, a denomination. There's a group in India, uh, an ethnic group called the Telugus. They're in, back to our India, is Telugus right here. Hyderabad, you may have heard of that. It's the tech capital of India. And the Telugus, big, big group. There's a bunch of Telugus in the Michigan and Detroit area. Um, and uh, but the, uh, the Telugu Baptist Church, they, they, they're one of the largest groups of Baptists in the whole world. And uh, they have one of the largest churches in the world, Baptist churches in the world, is in Hyderabad. And, uh, but through a long, complex thing, they, they, they had more res a whole bunch of resources uh, that had been from the Western mission agencies. And in India, when they got independence, required that all those, agents, all those resources be turned over to Indian uh, folks. Well, among the Telugus, especially as Hyderabad began exploding as a city for tech development, they ended up sitting on billions of dollars of resources and land and all kinds of stuff. And this one guy became like the godfather, literally, and, and uh, got connected with organized crime, started selling land, and you know, declared price would be like $100,000, the actual price was $400,000 you know, and all the extra ended up in his pocket and uh, he was connected with organized crime. Some of the Baptists said this is terrible and protested and eventually there was a murder that took place. Uh, this godfather guy had his son take out one of the people from the other faction and I mean it was just terrible what was going on and, and uh, so they ended up having a mediation. There were three different groups by the time that we got there um, that were all arguing. One that was for the Godfather under his control, one that was against him, and then one was saying, this is all corrupting everything, you know, let's just completely get rid of everything, start afresh. So we all met together in the Philippines, and uh, uh, there were two things that, in terms of the art, uh, the, the art, uh, one took place later, and this you may have been aware of, and you may do. Uh, I, think, I think it is something that's often in our training. Um, 
it's very important that the agreement be owned by the people, uh, the parties. Uh, you know, it can't be your agreement because then they don't have any ownership of it. And so we were going on, uh, it became very clear that we knew what the agreement was, but none of them would say it. And so they were just kind of going round and round. They were wanting me to say it. And uh, so I said, okay, I'm walking out of this room and I'm going to come back in 10 minutes and you're going to tell me what the agreement is. And I did. Just walked out. Came back in 10 minutes. They told me what the agreement was. It happened again, you know. Walked out. Came back. You know, and so, so sometimes, you know, that was, was a little bit of the art. Uh, but to know that, you know, you can, you can leave them the work if, because it's critical that they own the agreement. Uh, it can't be yours. Uh, it's got to be theirs. So that was, that was uh, one thing. But the, the other thing happened earlier in the process. Uh, the godfather didn't come at the last minute. And he sent his, uh, his second tier leaders. And um, that complicated things in a, in, in a rather dramatic way. But uh, we had the three groups, and we had all these folks from various uh, other uh, kind of global, regional mission groups and Baptist organizations that were kind of, but I was meeting privately with each of the groups. And there was a group of, of, of a small group of women who had come who were not part of any group, and they were not official parties to the negotiations. But we had this, after I'd met individually with all the groups to find out things, we had this big meeting with everybody present. Uh, and the women wanted to speak. And I'd given all the parties a chance to speak. And, and I said, you know, that I'm going to give the women a chance to speak. They've come here. And, uh, you know, everybody knew they weren't a party to the, they, they, but they, they did have a message they wanted to bring. Well, this guy stood up who was part of the Godfather's uh, uh, group, he stood up and he started saying, no, no, they can't speak. They can't speak because they really belong to this group, you know, and he's, he's going on and on. And, and, uh, and I, I said, look, I'm facilitating this. I don't know who's what. And they've come. Uh, we're gonna, this is the context in which they can speak, and I'm giving them permission to speak. And he refused to shut up. He just kept talking and talking and talking. So finally, I stand up, and, and I, I, I try to talk quietly at a level voice as he's yelling. He's yelling and gesticulating all over the place. And I said, you're out of order. Sit down. I said, you're out of order. Sit down. I said, I'm the facilitator. I made the decision. You're out of order. Sit down. He wouldn't do it. Wouldn't do it. As I'm getting closer and closer to him, this guy from the opposing faction comes up behind me and reaches around to try to grab a hold of the guy. I whip around, I say, you sit down! <laughs> guy, and then I'm thinking, this is all blowing up, you know? This reminds me of that early church meeting that didn't go well. And uh, what do I do? And all I could, all that was in my mind was Desmond Tutu and Alan Bozak and Frank Chikani in South Africa kneeling in front of the police in the anti-apartheid movements, you know, just kneeling and praying. Was, I think a divine gift, because I certainly didn't have it at that moment. And so I just, I just fell to my knees and just started praying very quietly, silently. You could have heard a pin drop. And that, that, that the Godfather's guy, he completely shut up and I was silent for a long long time partly because I had no clue what to do next <laughs> no clue what to do next and then I started praying out loud and I, I, and I mentioned in my prayers about the elephant in the room uh, that the Godfather wasn't present and what that meant in terms of how we were going to deal with this process and um, and, and it was amazing. That was the breakthrough that got us so that we could really start doing some serious work. And uh, it was interesting. After that, the Godfather's top henchman, he was like a puppy dog following me around. It, he, you know, from that point on, he, it just completely changed his mindset and how he related, uh, uh, related to me. You know, again, it's total art, inspiration, however your religious faiths may be, you know, that sense of that we're not in this alone. There's a, 
spirit of God, spirit of the cosmos, whatever it is you want to think about that has, uh, as King speaks about, the arc of the universe is long, but it bends toward justice. I think there's a concern for, you know, in the cosmos for justice and peace and how we do that, trying to find ways to connect with that in ourselves because um, sometimes, sometimes we need something beyond ourselves because we're not adequate to the task. We're not adequate to the task. Uh, my, uh, when we moved here, uh, my wife, we came here about 20 years ago for uh, my wife to direct a agency, a social service agency in Hamtramck. And uh, she came to me very early in that process and said, do you ever feel overwhelmed that you're out of your league? I said, all the time, all the time. That's part of it. And uh, she's been phenomenal. Uh, she's kind of the chaplain to the whole city there in Hamtramck. But, uh, you know, that, that many times you'll have those moments too, I'm sure, where you see something and the pain that's been inflicted on each other and uh, you wonder how on earth are we going to find some sort of way here and uh, you know I think that's that, that, those are the times when we need to find a, that place within and beyond us and you know uh, the deep wells from which we can draw and uh, so I encourage you to be open to that uh, you know have your tools have your processes <laughs> they're critical they're very very critical and important there's sometimes that other moment that comes. So I don't know how long you can go. I can go talk for hours and hours and hours, but I'm not going to do that. So. <laughs> okay. Any, <laughs> lots of questions. Carolyn? Have you ever heard about Kay Prentice? Who? Kay Prentice? No, I haven't. I would be delighted to learn. I'm always open to learning new... That's one reason I tell these mini biographies. By the way, I've got a uh, website, uh, danbuttry.com, which... Um, I'm trying to make a, a global resource center and, and uh, tell, it's like I got over 160 mini biographies. Some are famous people, some are people you haven't heard of. But there are so many wonderful, wonderful people and experts and activists in and, and all these fields and I'm always delighted to learn new people. So well, tell me about it. A number it. of us here have, all, have been trained by her in ah, her, in her awesome. concept of uh, peacekeeping circles. Oh yes, okay, I've heard of peacekeeping circles. Kay Prentice? P-R-A-N-I-S. Prentice. Yes, I know about the peacekeeping circles. Because, um, for instance, we use um, um, talking pieces. Yes. Um, to facilitate. Yeah. We, we had that in the Naga Peace process. The Quake, British Quakers brought that in. And, uh, and Wati like did a wonderful... Is, is the concept behind most of your work the re religious aspects that bringing together people of because it seemed to me that probably in Africa you didn't really have Christian uh, actually in Africa Africa is hugely Christian and yeah. hugely Muslim it's about probably half and half in some countries it's half and half like Nigeria and Ethiopia but uh, religion is huge in Africa uh, and um, you know I, I do a lot of most of my work starts in Christian context, but I'm often dealing with uh, interreligious things and have trained a lot of Muslims and Buddhists and some Hindus. And, and uh, so, um, you know, I think, I think religion uh, has many times been overlooked uh, by a lot of Western ways of thinking. And yet that's a major, major uh, piece. And in peacemaking, it can be a, a key a key component to bring in. You know, re religion is often used to f add gasoline to the fire. And, you know, we've seen a lot of religious bigotry and violence in every major religion that's been dominant somewhere. There's, there's this national violent expression. You know, Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, Judaism, all have had very violent expressions. But they've all also got incredible peace traditions and resources within them. And so, you know, part of my work is to try to help people to access the peace traditions, but also to acknowledge the, 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 the ways that, that they can uh, end up seeing that faith expressed violently. Because, uh, you know, sometimes people say, well, that's not genuine. Well, it is. It, it's part of the reality we got to deal with. And, uh, so, so I try to, to, to do that, but uh, the peacekeeping circles, you know, very, very important, the relational dimension, you know, there, there's I think a whole family of uh, concepts and tools that have that kind of relational dimension, that's very, very important. 
I never thought about the the violent part. Often comes from the religions and dominant. Mm-hmm. Is that what? I think it's more a sociological thing of power mm-hmm. than than a religious thing, and uh, um, and so when you're in a particular conflict, people will point to the dominant ones and say, you know, it's the religion. And so part of what we're trying to do is, is so no, it's not the religion per se. It's, uh, it's, 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 it's really issues of power and social dominance and religion becomes a part of the clothing in which that is expressed. And uh, so we, we use uh, uh, one of the key concepts we get, and I div- got this from Training for Change, but it's uh, uh, the name's going to come. Up. Uh, Arnold Mendel uh, has done uh, a lot of work, and he he had this concept of mainstream and margin. That in every group you've got the mainstream, and then you've got the, the, the ones that set the the rules for the group. And it's not a matter of number; it can be the majority, but it can also be a minority. Um, and they have the power to set the rules for the group. And then you have the, mar- the, the margins who are alternatives, and there could be many different alternatives to the group. And so um, we do a lot with that. Generally, the mainstream is clueless to the experience at the margin. And what often happens is, like if you're doing with, uh, trying to deal with racism, all the whites get defensive. If you're trying to deal with sexism, you know, all the, all the, uh, Men get defensive. If you're trying to deal with homophobia, you know, all the straights get defensive. And you don't have any learning going on when you're defensive. And so how do you deal with these kind of dynamics in a way where people can get the ahas and they can see, because all of us are mainstream some way and marginal some other ways. And, you know, as, as mediators, especially when you're connected with a court, you got a huge mainstream position that you have. And some of us who are kind of more liberal or progressive, we're very uncomfortable being mainstream. We, we don't like to think of us ourselves that way. Activists hate to think of ourselves as mainstream, and yet if we're, if we're facilitating a workshop, if we're mediating, we are mainstream. And, and so to know that, to own that, and then to make intentional choices to maximize what's positive for conflict and be aware of how we can act cluelessly uh, uh, to, to, to make conflicts worse. And, and to, to realize how, you know, somebody who say like is a bully, a bully in school is mainstream, but then you put that bully into a situation with the mediator and the school administration, all that. The bully is feeling very marginalized, you know. And so, so be, to be able to understand those dynamics, uh, so that you can process it in a constructive way and invite people to make choices uh, for what's positive. Because being mainstream or margin, neither of those are right or wrong. They just are. What's right or wrong is how we act, whether we're mainstream or how we act, whether we're margin. And so trying to understand those kind of dynamics, I found is the most helpful thing. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so that, that's been probably the most profound piece that we do when we do our training around the world, because every conflict has power dynamics. Every conflict has a mainstream. And usually the mainstream have no idea what it's like in the margins. Uh, I deal with a lot of religious violence, and uh, so I was in the Philippines, and it's a primarily Christian country, and the Filipinos have no idea, most of the Filipino, Filipino Christians have no idea what it's like to be a Muslim in the Philippines. But you go across the straits to Indonesia, a Muslim country, most of the Muslims have no idea what it's like to be a Christian in Indonesia. You know, It's the same kinds of conflicts, but just the labels are different. You know, and and you can see it at so many different levels, and so that that's been one of the most uh, helpful things to, and, and and you know, as a mediator, sometimes if you could, you know, that may be something to to study, and I invite you to explore that further. But that's been one of the most helpful things. I'm just curious, touched on this, but when you go or call someplace to help out, there's some issue or issues that are at the head of the problem 
how much time or effort would you say percentage-wise goes into just not even dealing with that stuff, but just getting the parties to know each other better? Mm -hmm. I can't put it in a formula thing, because I think that's where the art really comes out. But I think you're right, that is a really important important thing to do and it's uh, and I think that was part of what the football match did uh, I was in the in the uh, Burma peace process we had one one uh, the, the first time we had all the ethnic leaders together I was never involved with the face to face with the military because they said it's an internal affair and they refused to have me present they wouldn't let me be present when they were present so I did most of my work with the various ethnic groups because there were this huge range of ethnic groups and they had, they had um, a couple uh, umbrella organizations but they had very different views about how to take on the peace process. Some wanted to, very strongly to go to the peace process, others wanted to keep fighting and so, so that's where a lot of my work was doing, it was going on to try to facilitate that discussion so that they could sit down at the table with the government of Myanmar. And um, so at one point we, we ended up having talks at this Thai military resort in northern Thailand and uh, the Thai uh, intelligence provided security and all this kind of stuff and so we're there at this really nice restaurant at the military resort and uh, they had a uh, uh, they had a karaoke guy, you know. So we ended up doing karaoke and having the tables, you know, back and forth and karaoke. And, and again, it was relationship building that happened and it changed the, you know, the context in which we were meeting uh, before. And so I think, I think some of that relationship building can be very, very important. Um, sometimes, you know, when you're going out to lunch, do you have conversations besides what's on the agenda, you know? Uh, where you get to know each other's people and uh, sometimes in mediation that can uh, that can play a role too. So what are the steps that you see that you take in a, a mediation for your, how, how do you begin? How do you begin to explain the process? Or do you... Yeah, that, um, again that's uh, like I say, I, I'm not formally trained. Um, uh, I have I've never been in a formal course. I've read more than I can count on. Uh, I mean, I've read tons and tons of stuff, and I've talked and talked and worked alongside many, many people. I've, I, 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 we, we call what we do the University of the Streets. Uh, it's come out of people's movements. Uh, uh, but uh, so, so I know some of the steps. Um, you know, Plowshares Institute, I don't know if you know about them, in Connecticut, you know, followed a lot of their stuff and read things and Eastern Mennonite stuff, John Paul Lederer. So there's, but, but I find that a lot of these um, steps you, you kind of have to, you, you, you have a plan and my first plan is to, is usually to try to get to know each per person or group separate. Uh, so, so, so I try to meet individually uh, first and here people outside of the arguing context and uh, so, so usually that's a piece and then get people together and then you know have a facilitated thing you know we've sometimes used those talking uh, whatever it may be some sort of item that you use um, to try to maintain discipline um, uh, but a chance for people to, to, to uh, to talk and so part of it is is getting then the stories out hearing the stories and um, and then trying to uh, to find where where the common ground is and where the issues are and and to identify those um, a couple things uh, uh, along that line is that um, I find that one of the most critical things to do is to establish hope and, and give people vision. Uh, so, so, for example, when I was dealing with the, the military in Burma, uh, their whole thing was that they had two things that I think were perhaps in their subconscious. 
One is that they were trying to keep the country from blowing apart, kind of like you saw in Yugoslavia, you know, where, where when Tito died, the country just exploded in all this uh, violence. And, and the military came to power because there was a democratic government, and the democratic government was mainstream, ethnic Burman, religious Buddhist, and all the ethnic minorities and religious minorities felt like they were not included in the country. And so they, the, the, uh, the violent resistance started under democracy. So the military came to power to try to keep it from blowing apart. That's a legitimate need, a legitimate interest to, 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 to keep the country from exploding in violence even though they're doing horrific things and you know it's like sometimes you have to find where is that legitimate need underneath somebody who's expressing it in a horrible way the the uh, the other concern is if we go to a democracy what's going to happen to me am i going to be executed you know imprisoned and executed and so there's a self-interest side uh, that uh, so if you're if you're trying to get a military to step down, uh, go back to the barracks. You know how, how do you make it so that they are willing to take that risk? And so, so I think sometimes trying to give stories that show how other people have solved some similar conflicts. Not to say this is how ours is going to go, but that there are some ways that people, other people have gone. So raising hope and vision, you know, to, to say, you know, that, uh, that there, we can succeed at this, there's others who've succeeded at it. Because I think if people don't have hope, they won't take the risk. But when people have hope, they'll, they'll take some amazing risks. Yeah, thank you. I also want to apologize to the assembly about 10 to 1. But bringing things very much to home, we look at over the you know over this last election, and it's interesting that the mainstream you had the elites, so so called, and the mainstream and the marginal, and now it seems to make the marginal are the mainstream, mm -hmm. and the mainstream are the marginal, and I'm wondering from a, all sorts of levels, from individual levels, from an organization like ours, where do we go from here mm -hmm. in terms of bridging? these gaps. I mean, I have a really close friend from childhood where I didn't return his phone call for four weeks because I couldn't stand the emails he was sending. <laughs> and, I understand. And I'm just wondering, as I say, at all levels, and what what wisdom do you have to offer? And where, where do you, I mean, is there really a need? Or are we just going to sort of muddle through? Or are there things that we can do, as I say, not only as, our, as individuals, but as the DRC itself? Um, well, I wish I knew. Uh, I'm, I'm in there with you. Uh, you know, I think for, for, for all of us, this is a big uh a big thing, and I, and I don't know where it's going to go. I think none of us do. Uh, my my feel, gut feel, and worry is that this is going to be uh, uh, time. You know, I, I got the conflict resolution side of me. I've also got the nonviolent activist side of me, and there's there's a part of me saying this is the time for we're going to have a lot more struggle, and and it could get a lot more intense, and we could see some things we hold dear about what this country is all about that may be at high risk. But, and I think in your question you said something um, very important, is that, that uh, some of what gave Trump uh, a lot of his power were people who were feeling marginalized. And, 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 and uh, you know, I'll speak as a democratic activist. I was campaigning for Hillary and things like that. But, but a lot of the democratic leadership has become elitist. In that, it's kind of like, okay, and I and I heard I I heard these conversations from white liberals in Boston, and I heard them from the democracy movement in Burma. Same conversation. We know what you folks need. 
you know, trust us, we'll take care of it. You know, it, it's saying, you know, we're part of it. We can, we can relate, but it's not genuine democracy. It's kind of a, rep, this will represent you. And some of the folks are saying, wait a minute, what you're saying is not what, and, and I think that there's, there's been some of that alienation that's been experienced. And we haven't figured out how to how to respond to that, and and so uh, that's often very fertile ground for for uh, demagoguery or uh, other kinds of populism that that can be can take advantage of that. Uh, and and uh, you know already there's some people that you know you're hearing some interesting conversations of some Trump supporters saying, well, he's going to change, <laughs> you know. But others who say, well, that wasn't exactly what, you know, he's switching already on us, the kind of a bait and switch kind of thing. And, and you know, and then, then some of us who see the issues of racism, you know, and, which was huge, uh, you know, racism and sexism and all that kind of stuff was explicitly made a major thing. But um, let me give an art thing. Uh, Daniel Hunter, I don't know if any of you know Daniel Hunter. Uh, He's, uh, he's in Philadelphia. Uh, he wrote a wonderful book called Strategy and Soul. Uh, Daniel, uh, I first met, when he's, uh, we were part of the Baptist Peace Fellowship together. I first met him when he came to one of my trainings at the age of 14 and he said, I want to do this for my life. He's a genius, a literal genius. He, he, and uh, he's done training for a lot of the Occupy people, a lot of the glo globalization stuff. He's, He's, he's now on the global training staff for 350.org. I don't know if you know that. That's key global, global warming or you know, climate change organization. But Daniel, um, he went with me to Nagaland when he was 18 years old. And I've got a lot of stories about Daniel. Like I say, he was a genius in art. We were in Burma at this seminary, a Baptist seminary, that had very strong views about women. They had uh, half the student body was women, uh, two, the, the, they were on their second female president, and uh, we were invited to do training. Well, this, uh, we, one of our mainstream margin exercises was to say, in every group there's ways we're different. Name of way we're different, you know. And uh, somebody might say, you know, gender. So all the males over here, all the females over here. And everybody moves and, you know, Age, so you know, you divide up by age or wh whatever it may be, all kinds of ways, you know, glasses, you know, not glasses. And, and so we did something, and I think it was gender ended up coming out, or, or it could have been uh, marriage, married and single. And, um, and, but I think it was gender, yeah. We had more women in that training. They're, they're all over on one side, and the men over here. And there was a lot of stuff happening, you know, kind of conversation, you know, energy. And Daniel says, you know, you notice anybody want to talk about what's here? And, and the women started talking about how they still are marginalized in the seminary, even though they got a woman president and they're, you know, majority in this group. And this one guy who's older than all the other students he starts saying, well, the women, they just really need to have some sex. He didn't say it that, that gently. He said, and, and, you know, get a good husband and all this. And all the men move away from him. You know, it's like, he's not talking for us. <laughs> you know? And the women are furious. And Daniel did a very interesting thing. Daniel ended up moving and standing next to him and kind of talking, not taking his side, but facilitating the discussion, standing next to him while everybody else has moved away. And uh, the women could defend themselves. They didn't need any help, you know, they were, they were really wonderfully feisty. And, um, and, you know, the discussion went on and all that. Daniel and I, as we're going back, uh, were discussing this guy, and we were wondering if he was actually a military uh, government plant, because uh, that can often happen. And uh, so we didn't we didn't like him either, but we were trying to think, you know, how do, how do we handle this? We're coming back for a couple days, two more days training, 
The guy didn't show up the second day. He was doing something, supposedly. Uh, but he came the third day, and we were doing nonviolence. And this is while there's still a military dictatorship. We're in the capital city doing nonviolence training. And everybody was afraid to, to say what was going on. They were all being polite to us. This guy ended up talking about the real deal and putting it on the table. And he said, look, I'm Karen. And we had a Karen family. When the military came through a sweep, uh, some of the soldiers got wounded. And this Karen family took in two of the wounded soldiers and tended them. And when the wounded soldiers recovered, they raped the wife and they murdered the husband. Said, so these are the people we're dealing with. How can we, how can we respond to this kind of violence and oppression? And, I, and we thought, you know, this guy, as obnoxious as he was on the one issue, somehow, and maybe it was Daniel standing with him even though he didn't agree with him, that allowed him to speak truth where nobody else was bold enough to do it. I don't know. I don't know. Sometimes that some of the art is, is to not, when somebody says something obnoxious to us, not to accept what they're saying, but to accept their humanity. And to, to and it, it somehow, and that gets back to the relationship building. Do, do I have enough of a relationship? That, and, and I think that was one of the real challenges in this election. A lot of us don't know how to talk to the people who are different than us. And so we end up not having the relationships. And, uh, and you know, so, so, so that's a key part of where the discussion has to go. You know, it's like after the, all the shootings of the black, uh, uh, mostly men, but uh, uh, by police officers, you know, the whole dis we got to have a discussion on race. Well, if you're going to have a discussion on race, who, who you got to get to the table? You got to get people to the, and it's not always at the table. But how do you get people together? And there are some people who do some very creative things sometimes on the streets, you know. And 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 I think that's a big part of of uh, what we have to do and facilitate schools. As uh, some I was talking with somebody about schools, uh, uh, you know, that that can be a very. I think it was with you. Yeah, yeah. And the peace circles in schools. Uh, you, know, you know, that sometimes those kind of places can be really, really important. I live in Hamtramck, where we got a really diverse population. And uh, there have been a number of uh, kind of cycles, but, uh, uh, but where we get uh, conversations in schools, uh, you know, where people are talking together. And I think that's really, really important. Yes. Stella and I were talking about having the dispute resolution center start a community discussion mm -hmm. between these groups, and it was brought to my mind many years ago when I was working with Bobby Kennedy, uh, and during the uh, presidential primary campaign, he came to Detroit, where I went to Cincinnati, and uh, we had a rally for Bobby Kennedy of uh, Norwood, which was a blue collar factory worker. The place was packed. And Bobby Kennedy spoke to these people and talked to them about you know, what they're facing. And they loved it. I think it was a month later, George Wallace came to town. Same place. Same crowd came out to listen to George Wallace, and they responded to him as enthusiastically as mm. they could. To Bobby Kennedy, I said, what is going on? Mm -hmm. What is going on? And this campaign just reminded me a lot yeah, of that. Yeah. And that is, we're talking past each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if we could ever have community discussions, and we've, we've had some of those in the past. Yeah. I think it's time to talk. You know, I think one way to do some community discussions, just as a tool that we've often found helpful, is to do fish bowls where you can get, you know, a smaller group that will focus the discussion, but then where periodically you can invite somebody who wants to, uh, from the group, from the outside circle, to step in. They can replace somebody in the fish bowl and keep the discussion going. But that can be a way to keep it from just, you know, kind of being all over the place. But uh, because I think, yeah, those kind of discussions would be a wonderful thing to facilitate and host. It may blow up. Yeah. <laughs> it's already blowing up. Yes, that's right. It's always risk. There's no guarantees in this work.
Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so you know, if if you're having a community discussion, you might you might identify who might be some initial speakers from different groups or different uh, positions. Yeah, different viewpoints, and and you know, have a good juicy question to start the discussion, and uh, you know, give them a good chunk of time. You know, 20 minutes, whatever. But it, it's a different thing than a panel. And a panel is very disempowering for the other people. You know, they can ask questions, but you know, fishbowl. Uh, uh, makes it more the group and you know the, uh, and especially if you know I could step in at some point and become a participant but it also is that I'm not just saying my when I'm in the fishbowl inside the group uh, inside the fishbowl circle uh, I also have to listen and interact you know so it's not just me telling my uh, my position or making my statement uh, I'm in the group, so there's a there's a dynamic in which I have to interact or respond, and the facilitator can ask questions, you know, to help people peel the onion, so to speak. Pretty small, then. Would you say four people would be good, so that you don't have it confused enough. That right, right, four to six, you know, depending on the size of the the larger group. Yeah. I've, I've worked with fishbowls, yes, <coughs> different ways, yes. Yeah. And that's, you, sometimes the people tap somebody and say, yeah. you leave and yeah. I'll get up. Yeah. yeah, and you know, and as a facilitator, there can be time when you, you know, you say, we're going to start with this group so everybody, you know, gets to hear that interaction and sets, sets the stage. But then when you say, if there's somebody who'd like to come in, you know, tap somebody and you can take their place in the, in the circle. Yeah, you mentioned about uh, raising the whole condition. And my, my guess is you being in the conflict, even as an outsider, but how do you, what do you do personally to keep your whole vision? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. Um, you know, I think this is where spirituality is a key part of it. And, um, uh, in our 10-day training, we have spiritual disciplines, and we talk at the end of the 10-day. Uh, I do experiential education, so the spiritual discipline, we don't say anything about it, we just kind of do it, and then we do the reflection at the end. I say, D now, what's that like? What's that like? We re reflect on it, and then we share what other people, you know, how do we sustain ourselves, and that's different for different people. And, of course, different faiths have different ways that they that they do that. Um, but, uh, you know, I think a, a, a lot of uh, a lot of activists, uh, and uh, even though I'm religious, I'm more on the activist side. Uh, but uh, I remember I worked very closely with a, a guy, uh, uh, a Quaker, British Quaker, John McConnell, and uh, in the Burma peace process, and we roomed together uh, sometimes, and um, you know, I just remember his centering uh, each day. And I thought, wow, you know, I don't do a lot of that. <laughs> I'm too busy, <laughs> you know. But, but I think that's, that's a key thing. For me, storytelling is a part of it. That's why I write, you know, s books like this. Because, you know, there's this narrative. The media was, I was, as I was driving here, I was listening to the media, you know, about false news. NPR was having a thing about false news. Some of you may have heard it. And... Uh, and it's important for us to tell the hopeful narratives and the hopeful stories because it can grow anywhere. Uh, two years ago, Sharon and I were teaching in Lebanon at the Arab Baptist Theological Seminary and we had, we, we, we had a woman from Syria. And after the first session where we were talking about win-win solutions, she said, she said, you know, you're coming from the US and it's easy for you to say this you know, can work. You know, it won't work here. This is a different situation. And I said, okay, I hear what you're saying, but, uh, you know, kind of stick with us, you know, suspend your judgment. See what, and we, we, at the end of the class, she ended up paying her way to the U.S. to get the 10-day training wow. that we were doing because it, she did a 180 on it. And I think part of it is, you know, how to, you know, this, this despair and Syria is a place that can produce despair. <laughs> I mean, understandably so. You know, I've been to Liberia. I spent a lot of time in Liberia. Talk about a place for despair. And, you know, and, and Burma, you know, for all the years, northeast India. 
Um, and uh, and so, so hope, I think, is the most radical thing. And Gandhi and Tutu, you know, they talk so much about hope and the, the incredible energy that can get released in hope. Uh, but to do that, you have to, uh, you have to have some sort of place that nurtures that for yourself. And so I think for the activist and the mediator, you know, if the people that you're working with are drawing the energy from you, where, where are you getting your energy from, you know? So, so I think taking care of ourselves is really, really important. There's times when I despair, you know? And, and, uh, and that's, that's, that's one reason we need these communities, groups like this, you know, to, to, to be there for each other. And uh, uh, sometimes when, you know, when your very best blows up to pieces, you know, who do you go to to cry with? And then they say, you know, yeah, but remember this and remember that. And, and you go back and you do it again. <laughs> so. I'm curious where uh, Aung San Suu Kyi's activities figured into your work or not. Yes. Was this in the same time frame? Oh, yes, 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 yes. I've never met Aung San Suu Kyi, uh, deliberately so. I could possibly have done that. I've been very close to people who've been at her birthday parties, her family, you know, the intimate circle. Uh, one was the president, this woman president of a seminary that I trained in. Um, but a um, uh, couple things about Aung San Suu Kyi. First, her father was the father of Burmese independence, Aung San. And uh, he had a vision of diverse Burma. And, and so he really welcomed the minority groups, the ethnic groups. He was assassinated right on the verge of independence. And, and a guy named Unu became prime minister. And, and it, though it was democratic, Unu was the one that, you know, majority rules and we're Burman, we're Buddhist. And so uh, all the Christians, Muslims, Hindus, all the ethnic minority groups, all of them all of a sudden felt disenfranchised. And Aung San had been very deliberate in that. Aung San Suu Kyi. I love her as a leader. I've written about her in one of my book, Interfaith Heroes. Uh, she's just dynamic, incredibly courageous, but she said, we gotta get democracy first and then we'll deal with, with the minorities. And the minorities said, that's not an answer for us because we had our problems under democracy. And so, so, so th they were saying we have to do both together. The democracy that you're talking about has to be, and, and she's actually been failing to address the issues of the Muslims, the Rohingyas, uh, uh, and, uh, and so, so, you know, I rejoice in her being prime minister, not prime minister, she's not prime minister, she's the power behind the throne because the Burmese military put something in the constitution that made it impossible for her to be prime minister. It's a long story. But she's effectively the, the leader of Burma now. And, and, and I, it's a wonderful, wonderful step in the right direction. But that's one of her weaknesses. And, uh, and she was under house arrest most of the time I was doing my most pivotal work in Burma. And uh, my, my mediation work, I never went to Burma. Um, I, we, we had it all outside in Thailand or Hong Kong. Um, uh, but once I started going to Burma, then I was doing nonviolence training, and she was under house arrest, and so we were keeping a really low profile, and if you want to be noticed, you go visit Aung San Suu Kyi. So <laughs> I never went close to her house. I knew where I was, but, uh, uh, and probably could have visited her, but that wasn't my role. Well, Dan, thank you so much. Really appreciate you sharing so many wonderful stories with us. Thank you, and uh, again, there's books, and if anybody wants to follow my work more, there's the, uh, the website, and then I also have trip notes that I send people from my various travels. Uh, you know, Great. we'll be in Lebanon and Egypt in January and February wow. doing a lot of this work.